trash boating. Today we're talking about bosses. These bad dudes are such an integral piece to the puzzle when designing an entry for most genres in gaming, let alone a platformer. Go on and think about your favorite Scrimblo and their many adventures through whatever baloney-filled world they live in. Chances are, in order to save the day, they're butting heads with at least a few not-so-friendly individuals that want to end your day. And that's not even counting the inevitable final climatic clash with the villainous poster boy waiting in the backdrop. From the prehistoric 8-bit days till now, whether we enjoy them or not, it's clear that boss fights are essential to the DNA of, well, video games in general. And the world's most beloved scrimblo duo of all time, Regina and Ma Banjo and Kazooie, are no exceptions. However, surprisingly enough, the original Banjo holds bosses at at least in the traditional big bad enemy ordeal sense, in a not so particularly high regard. There are bosses here, sure, but it's a far cry from something like the Mega Man series with its entire structure being built around the idea of taking out a legion of foes in a mono -e mono fashion at the end of every stage. It would be ridiculous to imagine a reality without these various Robot Master face-offs. It is simply what makes Mega Man, Mega Man. For a more traditional Jumping Man's choice, the iconic end of world castles from Super Mario would be a shell of their former self if you didn't have that infamous duel with Bowser at the bridge. A triumphant moment for the player that signifies clear progression across the game. <laughs> Mario isn't defined by these brief skirmishes, but their inclusion adds a sense of gritty tension that is packaged tighter than the relatively mundane action of stomping on Koopas. Even with an example that hits a wee bit closer to home in Banjo's ugly third cousin once removed Donkey Kong 64, we can see how much of a crucial role K. Rool's underlings play with their involvement quite literally gatekeeping your progression. Soon after starting that new save file, it almost comes as a subconscious expectation for the end of every location you visit to feature a melee with some sort of larger than life foe, a box to check off on if you will. It's clear to me that, no matter which way you shake it, boss encounters are a seemingly constant backbone of fundamental game design that can be creatively utilized in countless ways. I mean, come on, if mother flipping a Mario Party has boss fights, then you know it's a gaming cornerstone. Now, with all that being said, looking back on over to the Baron Bird game, it uh -huh. feels as though these bossy types of situations are few and far between. Not quite as impactful, so to speak. I mean, really, think to yourself, average YouTube enjoyer whose favorite game is Banjo-Kazooie. How many bosses are there actually? One? Five? Maybe even three? Yeah, not so easy to list them all out without a handy dandy video essay to look at, now is it? Although, I'm sure one fight in particular that every fan should immediately jump towards would be against the Wicked Witch herself, Gruntilda. It's a bit hard to ignore that crimson chin on the cover of the box, and of course the countless acts of verbally antagonizing you throughout the adventure. What can I say, she's a pretty darn good main villain, and you may think a full-blown discussion about her battle would make sense in a video going over the bosses of Banjo-Kazooie, but Nah, I won't be talking about it whatsoever. For one, I just find it funny not to given the context. And two, I'd like to instead dial in more closely on the lesser sub-esque bosses that could easily get swept under the rug in comparison. The guys you wouldn't see on a Watch Mojo Top 10 N64 Boss Fights video. From which, uh, yeah, there's not too much to pull from. Great segue into the meat of the video, I know. In fact, out of the nine main worlds that can BK's main adventure, only three of them have what most would describe as, for sure these guys are 100% totally bosses. And if we're being overly generous, you can bump that number up to six, as for a lot of instances there's a fine, is blood actually a boss or not, line being tiptoed around, but this gray area is where things get a little interesting. What first came across as a shallow attempt at such a seemingly crucial aspect of a platformer if not game in general, later made me stop to really consider what exactly makes a boss 
truly a boss. Of course, there's no ultra strict playbook to follow on proper boss design, so each instance of one in not only Banjo-Kazooie, but any game featuring them, is a chance to peep into the developer's mindset on what type of challenge they wanted to present the player with. Since in actuality, the very nature of bosses differs quite a bit from the normal gameplay loop you quickly grow accustomed to, at the very least in a platformer's concern. Instead of yippee and yahooing across a whimsical wonderland free as a whistle, you're usually locked into Mortal Kombat, looking across the room to a pair of sentient rock cans that want to strangle you for accidentally waking them up from an ancient slumber. Seems like a simple my B is out of the question. Okay, okay, enough horsing around. You know the rules, and so do I. So let's jump into this wacky topic by visiting the first traditional boss of Banjo-Kazooie, Konga. It's been drilled into my brain through just about every game with bosses that an encounter with one means somewhat of a big deal. It's something you have to actively build towards while also making sure you're locked and loaded upon arrival. This moderately peeved gorilla fellow is basically none of that. Konga is a perfect snapshot into the, for lack of a better term, low keyness BK deploys for its typical approach to bosses. He defies all sensible logic by foregoing some towering mountaintop or deep crevice of a dangerous dungeon. Instead, choosing to chill out on his tree out in the wide open, ready to be stumbled upon at any given moment. Common amongst Kazooie's rambunctious bunch of baddies is an introduction relegated to that of short and to the point. Regardless, his personality does shine through his not-so-great speech and overall pissed-off levels being apparent as he rains oranges down onto you. What Konga lacks in presentation, he makes up for mechanics mechanically with him serving his role as the introductory boss exceptionally well. At the beginning, it's not so much of a fight as it is a one-sided assault. But those oranges he's slinging your way serve to fuel a fun basic movement and puzzle exercise as he try to manipulate and time their landing to hit some switches. Kinda weird home decor, but I'm not one to judge. It's only after helping a little chimp with the most creative name I've ever seen that you finally get to stand on even ground with Kanga. His tutorial-esque methods of defeat keep trucking along as now your only option to combat his vitamin C overload is to get acquainted with the ability to shoot off eggs that you just so happen to learn from bottles right then and there. The speed of which he throws the oranges in combination with the limited footing you have facing him is a stark contrast from the previous more spacious dodging around when you are grounded. It's okay though, this man folds after only a couple of eggs to the face. Call him Rigby. Even if he wanted to kill you just a moment beforehand, I do have to admire Konga's sportsmanship as he hands over his jig he once bested. He uh, won't stop throwing fruit at you though. This rather quick exposure to a conventionally traditional boss may lead the player into a false sense of expectation for many more reminiscent of Konga to be in every world. But you know what they say about false senses of expectation. They're false. Whatever. The hope won't die for now as we meet the very next world's big baddie down on the shores of Treasure Trove Cove. A gigantic hermit crab named Nipper, master of the beach whose knowledge of sandy landscape knows no bounds. Here's a rare, albeit much appreciated, example of a Kazooie boss having at least some bit of noticeable flavor text in their arsenal before they get to going with the punching and the hurting. In all honesty, he's not that hostile to start with. Letting his passive aggressiveness slide, he just kind of shouts out to Banjo that this is his beach and will never find anything without his help. Which, uh, yeah, sure, buddy. It's not until Kazooie chirps up her classic smack talk that Nipper gets under understandably pissed off. It makes you wonder how good of people a banjo, and especially Kazooie are, if they're willing to stroll up to a somewhat friendly dude they've never met and completely murk him. I wish I could say this is the only instance of aggravated assault, but it is not. Anyways, the fight itself follows an extremely common method of boss design. Nipper unleashes his attack towards Banjo, a few swipes in quick succession, forcing you on the defensive until he enters a cooldown state to 
which you're free to lay some damage onto him. Despite the tempo of his meaty claws picking up over the battle, he still resembles that of a sitting duck with absolutely no mobility, making him look kinda sad the moment you decide to take a few steps back. Even so, a neat detail is how the only method to injure Nipper is the complete opposite from the previous fight with Kanga. Where he needed some projectile eggs to the face, Nipper laughs at such a weak tactic. So, an up close and personal peck to the eyeball does just the job to make him feel some pain. And after he goes completely blind, he goes completely missing. For real, he scurries away back into his shell that you then promptly enter and he's just gone. R.I.B. He was a good man. Okay, if you were expecting this cool boss thing trend to continue onwards into the following world, zuh, then you'd be sadly mistaken. At least in the form we've talked about up until now, you're not seeing something familiar until the near end of the game, six levels later, aboard the good old Rusty Bucket Bay. Yeah, whoopsies, I guess it's easy to forget to put bosses in your levels when you're too busy writing jokes about a tree's dehydrated nuts. But hey, Boss Boom Box happened to be the most bossy boss of all the bosses. One thing that immediately sets him apart from most others is how embedded into the level he's tucked away in. Instead of being all freely wheely, there's a sequence of actions you must do to enter his hold. And by actions, I mean blowing a gigantic hole in the ship's deck. Hmm, a floating jiggy resting above some totally normal and not to be concerned with planks of wood on the floor. Surely the game where everything you can think of has sentience, it's nothing that'll harm you. Oh wait, just kidding, it's a mad box. Yeah, I'm not singing Mr. Boom's praises based on character design alone here. In some ways, simplicity is key, to which BBB has it in spades. He starts off as one giant box towering over you, but he must not have that dog in him because he breaks apart rather easily, splitting in half, leaving his remaining pieces ever so slightly smaller. The more you break, the tinier he becomes, but consequently, the more boxes that are storming after you. And not to mention that these little boxes have a real sense of spunk about them. It's quite easy for you to feel overwhelmed as a result of an onslaught of demonic boxes swarming you. Although, subside your fear some, for Boombox leaves himself open to just about everything in your arsenal. There's a not-so-subtle suggestion of attack placed by the countless eggs lining the arena, but emphasis on suggestion. Going for a more aggressive approach with rolls, rat-a-tap wraps, or beak busters are all perfectly fine as well well, and can even lead to a faster breakdown of the many boxes coming for your behind. A pro player tip, use Wonder Wing. He does not like Wonder Wing. The openness of choice when dealing with Boombox is much appreciated as I've said Rusty Bucket Bay is among the end game set of levels, to which you should have total mastery of all of Banjo and Kazooie's moves by this point. It may seem overly simple on the surface, but trust me it's way more fun to play than to watch as you have to have a chance to soak up all of those feelings you feel when doing so. But uh yeah, that's it. See ya. <laughs> I wasn't lying when I said Kazooie doesn't hold this entire boss thing in high regard, which is a bit of a shame since what little we have here are highlights from their respective worlds. Their sparsity sprinkled across the adventure may even lead you to be craving more action, but quality over quantity, right? Well, my search for bosses in Banjo-Kazooie was almost finished until I peeped on over to the BK wiki page and was absolutely astonished at what I discovered. The these people really had the audacity to label the Black Snippet from Treasure Trove Cove as a boss. This man put a single adjective in front of a grunt enemy's name and thought he was that guy. Well, we shall see this crab's merit and how it stacks up to the crucial aspects of what it means to be a boss, apparently. I mean, to cut him some slack, I guess he does fit the criteria of what an average boss looks like, with him sizing you up before the bouts and having his own arena that he himself was trapped inside. But if we're keeping it real, I'm not exactly buying it. For starters, it's kinda hard to ignore the fact that he's just a slight variant of a normal snippet. You know, the same things that patrol the beach as Grunty's worldly fodder force. Now, to his defense, despite what you may hear, size doesn't exactly matter when it comes to a boss. Take for example that one guy from that one Bomberman game. 
I don't know his name. It's true that in typical fashion, you'll see large, imposing figures compared to the main hero, such as what we've talked about up until this point. Yet, it's important to remember the action portion of the boss, as they heavily rely on the mechanical side of things to engage the player to make for a thrilling and taxing encounter. And as far as I know, there's no required height limit to pass in order to excel at that job. Your bark has to have some bite to it as well, to which Black Snippet is a total joke. As a matter of fact, you don't even really have to fight him. The Jiggy is still unblocked once he's released from his cage, so you can just leap over him and be on your way. You may take a hit or two of damage, but like, okay? But if you do sign up for this hair-raising bout, know that he is ever so slightly stronger than these standard snippets. Even so, I kid you not, those two regular ones from the inside of Nipper Shell from earlier gave me a lot more trouble than this guy. Ah, not my most well-defined moment, I admit. I want to clarify that it's not solely for the reason that Black Snippet is more akin to a bland foot soldier that I want to gatekeep him from the boss club. No, it's mainly due to him absolutely floundering in the presentation department, an often overlooked aspect of a boss that is vital in setting that initial feel and overall general mood for the encounter. How threatening they come across, which directly ties into how much the player should care. The culmination of their boss aura, as it were. There's a multitude of ways to get the tension going, all of which Black Snippet fails horribly at. His feisty and brash attitude is a whiff of potential, but there's no follow-up on it as there's no immediate call to action. As I've said, the fight is more or less optional. The true star attraction here is the initial word puzzle where you have to spell out Banjo-Kazooie within 100 seconds. But I beg the question, would you include that as a part of the boss? Hmm. Regardless, afterwards, once he's released, dealing with him feels almost like an afterthought. It doesn't help that the Sandcastle Room's incredibly laid-back music doesn't change a beat, keeping that relaxed vibe present regardless of someone trying to cut you down from across the room. If you want an actual good example of all of these elements coming together in the correct way, you don't even have to go that far. I'm sure thousands of children's nightmares were fueled by the dastardly Snacker the Shark. Oh yeah, I'm positive I reawakened some deep unintended fear in a lot of you just now. Okay, so you're running around TTC like a goofball, all fun and games, until you decide to take a dip into the water. Big mistake, noob. Out of absolutely nowhere, Snacker appears from thin air as soon as you submerge. He wastes absolutely no time in gunning straight for you alongside a terrifying change in music. This will certainly throw you straight into a pure state of panic on your first go around, making him a certified menace to society. Plus, he does all of this while still having the hubris to crack some jokes at you. What a mad lad. By the way, I should note that he's actually just considered a normal enemy, a totally optional out of the blue thing you hardly have to interact with. Black Snippet. Take some notes, please. But as he is now, can he truly be considered a boss? Eh, you know what? Screw it. At this point, I'm just gonna start making up my own terms and stick Black Snippet into the specialized grunt enemy box and be done with it. Now, not to totally dismiss the idea of a smaller, fodder-esque threat having the capability of filling a boss's shoes, because Banjo-Kazooie actually dives headfirst into an archetype that I'll name Enemy Rushes. To not sound redundant, it is exactly what it sounds like. Concerning these groups of baddies, there are lessons to be taught on what is vital to deliver on. For this uncommon type of boss battle needs extra effort put in to compensate for being so small. As I think most can agree, fighting a bunch of normal-ish enemies at face value won't have that same flair as a single big one. I know this is where the validity of the subject matter can start to get a little dicey, but make sure to keep an open mind as the concept 
concept of an enemy rush can serve to spotlight the more or less standard combat system of the game. We can see through a ton of platformers, especially that of the 3D variety, that their combat systems tend to be totally sound, yet often underutilized. Being forced to engage with enemies you'd otherwise scoff at is a great way to mandate usage of a fun skill that you'll end up wanting to master. And if all of that doesn't wet your whistle, then just remember how satisfying a game of numbers can be as evident with a boss of boom box and the many boxes that you boxed up. Box. Clanker's Cavern is home to our first round of lovely troglodytes. It seems like some uh, lucky snippets found their way into some toxic waste and gained the superpowers of a bulging eye and speech impediment. Nice. Despite the sized up claws, they behave nearly identical to a normal snippet, aka easy peasy. Just flip all six of them onto their backs and then put their tragic souls to rest. I'll admit it's not a super exciting showcase of what this format can bring from a combative angle. But the saving grace is how well the environment is used to give this interaction its own pizzazz. Yes, the area you do battle in matters a whole heck of a lot. With respect to Konga and Nippers more out in the open arenas, it's normally in a boss's best interest to be held in a location that is either cool aesthetically or one that plays into the fight itself, and we have a slight combination of both here. In addition to the radical green glow the radiation is putting off, the entire room is viewed from a semi-bird's eye shot, making the multi-layeredness of the platforms a bit trickier and somewhat deceptive to maneuver around. This will almost guarantee to throw you off the first time if the muties are at an alternate level of elevation than you. A pro player tip, getting them side by side and then beak bustering them into oblivion is my preferred for a choice of murder. On a different note, the power of music is showcased in full force as the tight and fast paced tune you're currently hearing not only does a splendid job at setting the mood for this specific battle, but it manages to work to an even greater extent due to its starkly contrasting the slower paced underwater rendition of Clinker's Cavern's theme. By suddenly kicking up the tempo considerably, the game has instantly conveyed that there is some sort of a trouble just around the corner. It's a a nice case of whiplash that makes this small portion of the level stick out in an otherwise semi-forgettable world. All around, these mutated freaks are a decent introduction to test the waters on what is boss material that is quickly expanded upon in the game's next level, Bubble Gloop Swamp, as you stumble upon an army of yellow flibbits. To take a moment before the brawl begins, it's interesting to take notes on which bosses are actually evil or not. Are they working under Gruntilda herself, or are they just some random NPC bot? Somebody like a boombox or Kanga seem to be normal inhabitants of their worlds, albeit just overly aggressive in nature, probably needing that good beating you dished out. These yellow flippets though, they're only attacking Banjo as an act of self-defense. Paint the picture with me. Me. A total stranger in both familiarity and species rolls up into your home and the moment you come out to handle the situation, he takes out your whole family leaving your species for extinction. During which, you're hopping and rat-tat-tapping around a rather cramped piece of swampland looking for any solid footing while trying to simultaneously dodge and attack flibbits who are much more attentive, aggressive, and sporadic compared to the muties. This makes for an enemy rush that demands a ton more focus. There is a sense of dialed-in concentration you feel when you're not exactly sure which spot the next flibbit will pop out of, but you must be ready regardless. I would say all of this combines for a nice riveting challenge, but the battlefield will soon look as if you input an infinite honeycomb health cheat code, so if you die here, you're just bad. 
I think what I enjoy the most in this case is how much this boss feels like a total ambush. You don't really expect it at all, and if it wasn't for that brief declaration of war from the Flibbits, you'd be looking like a Mr. Krabs all of a sudden. And it's not as if this takes place in some random off the path corner of the level like with the Muties or even Nipper. Nope, it all goes down right slab dab in the middle of the swamp. So you'll have to confront these guys sooner or later to access the many branching paths from this point. I appreciate how rather sporadic the implementation of these bosses always comes off as. I never get that classic end of level hunch from a typical game. Uh, not to say those are bad of course, pros and cons, but Banjo-Kazooie is rather refreshing in retrospect. For example, this swampy throwdown feels in total opposition to the final enemy rush. Or should I say enemy swarm. Click Clock Wood is home to many things such as wood and this beehive. Starting the world off in the springtime, we can see how there's no way for Banjo to go inside and take a peep. Although, with the magical powers of Mumbo Jumbo, you're turned ever so conveniently into a bee. Waltzing on into the hive, the Zubbas introduce themselves as the guardians of Grunty's golden honey piece. They speak of some sort of honey bear they've been warned about that may come to try and steal it. Surely such a thing would never happen, right? Right. The setup to the eventual battle in this very hive is manjo cool to see, as there hasn't been an instance of you meeting the boss itself quite some time before the actual fight, which does play into the overarching thematic of Click Clock Wood's passage of time. One day we're friends, but the next day we're not. Probably because I'm not a bee anymore. Kinda off topic, but this reminds me that a lot of inhabitants of the BK world hates bears for some reason. Makes you think. Anywho, once we show our true colors, these Zubbas stand their ground for they are on a duty to protect this Jiggy at all costs. And they'll die trying. They do indeed die. Combat across the entirety of Banjo-Kazooie is definitely on the slower pace side of things, letting you take your time to dismantle anything that stands in your way. But here, not at all. The literal swarm of Zubbas relentlessly come charging at you back to back with no rest in between until you've beaten them all. Each one only takes a single hit to put down, but you better make good from your brief chance to take it out before the next Zubba is already in your face. Fast and intense and satisfying feels like an understatement. This is what an enemy rush should feel like. The sense of overwhelming odds coming towards you despite those same odds being virtually no threat on their own makes for an exciting time. Keeping the pressure on the player close to a maximum at every moment really strives home the rush portion of what can make this archetype so fun. Speaking about fun, here's my honorary Wonderwing is busted comment about using Wonderwing because yes, it is busted as always. Except this time, these dummies swan tom bomb straight into you, so either they're extremely dedicated or extremely stupid. When the Zubbas eventually do admit defeat, they are high key butthurt by saying they don't even care that they lost and they were bored of guarding it anyways. Yeah, months of hard work down the drain means nothing to you. Cope better next time, my guy. I guess they took their L to heart as they've upped and moved out of their home by the next time you see them. And and come winter, their hive is totally destroyed. Oh, how cruel the passage of time can be. Welp, there you have it. Those are all the bosses of Banjo-Kazooie, or at least the ones that are the most well accepted according to whatever the BK wiki said. But what kind of video essay would it be if I didn't challenge the status quo of all the other white guys on YouTube talking about this game for the 80th time? Leaving things as is kind of leaves a null void in my soul, as if there's something missing. I mean, we've left out an entire third of the worlds from the game. Do they truly have nothing to offer? Well, perhaps there could be more to discuss, but only if we expand the scope of our little monkey brains even further to new possibilities. Reaching back to the core question of what exactly makes a boss, a boss. If we are willing to accept these more brief tussles with the black snippets, 
and more importantly, the Muti Snippets, Yellow Flibbits, and Zubbas as bosses, then what is stopping us from labeling the, oh, I don't know, Sir Slushies from Freeze Easy Peak right alongside them? <laughs> These killer and awfully annoying snowmen make themselves known from the moment you step onto the main portion of the frozen peak, cackling away while tossing snowballs at you from all corners across the level. Trust me, you'll be more than motivated to take them out after hearing their grating laugh for the millionth time. But aside from having to semi-constantly dodge their attacks, there's no cohesion to defeat all five of them. It's only when you start doing so that you'll find goodies hidden in their snowy corpse. Grunty switches, mumbo tokens, and honeycomb pieces all culminating into a jiggy spawning atop of the giant snowman. So, wait a second. Defeating these seemingly above average enemies is actually required to fully complete the level? In other words, combating them is directly tied to a jiggy objective. The same prize that has been awarded after the defeat of every boss thus far, regardless of them being big or small. Heck, this right here is asking a lot more from the player than most of the bosses I've covered up until now. You can't just walk up and peck them to death like you can with most other enemies in the game. No, no, no. These Sir Slushies require a nicely lined up beak bomber shot straight to the X's of their hats. And missing them ever so slightly will often cause you to slam right into the ground, making you reconsider your life choices up until this point. So I beg the question, why can't these guys be the boss of Freeze Easy Peak? And not to strain the viewers' minds too hard, I think I know that answer answer in advance. Again, this all comes down to presentation. How players are able to perceive potential threats is key. Let's look back at the yellow flibbits as a prime example. There, you're merely taking out six grunt-esque flibbits to spawn the jiggy. But the game puts special emphasis on the encounter by announcing the soon-to-be battle, grouping them together in an onslaught, and kicking the music in high gear to make you feel the pressure of the situation. The five Sir Slushies, despite technically needing more effort to destroy, have way less of an impact due to them not introducing themselves, being spaced out all over the level, and having no special boss-esque musical takeover. They, as a result, feel more or less like standard enemies you can slip past with no second thoughts, on some grublin type energy. When you take out the rush part out of the enemy rush archetype, that boss aura falls flat. Despite you in a way doing the same thing to complete the objective as the others I've listed out. So should we stretch out the liberal usage of the phrase boss and demand the wiki be updated with the Sir Slushies getting the justice they deserve? Well, I do not care whatsoever, but hold that thought as I'm not even done yet. This topic gets even more sticky when you try to broaden the landscape of criteria even further. Our final two remaining worlds, Gobi's Valley and Mad Monster Mansion, have absolutely no instance of a boss that I could even try to convince you of. Or do they? Firstly, in the sandy desert, once you have risen at the ancient tomb of... <laughs> King Sandy Butt. You're swiftly prompted to get the heck out of there or face his wrath. To every 10 year old in 1998 surprise, stepping another foot further traps you inside the tomb. Except instead of facing the remains of the king in mummy form head on, you're met with an elaborate maze to traverse with a stress inducing time limit slapped on. And if it couldn't get any more tense, the music progressively gets faster and faster to the point where you're more freaked out over that then the timer about to hit zero. Which, if that does happen, then you're in for a nightmare fuel treat that'll make even Snacker look tame. Oh, he did. And to make matters worse, those devious Brits even had the goal to sneak in a grunty switch inside the maze. Absolutely evil, I tell ya. Moving on, we see slumbering inside of Mad Monster Mansion's mansion, that boy Napper. This ghoulish fellow at a glance could be sized up as a perfect candidate for a boss. He's directly in charge of guarding Grunty's gold and quite frankly, with all due respect to peed off boxes 
than radioactive crabs, Napper is by far the most intimidating presence compared to every actual boss in the game. It doesn't hurt that he gets introduced by the Wicked Witch herself, making sure we feel especially unwelcomed. The stage is set for an epic throwdown in the dining room. But instead, we get Napper taunting us while any attack we throw at him bounces straight off his spooky booty. And there's no hidden extra move to learn to handle this situation. Rather, we have to get a little clever. He mentions that she'll never get the jiggy while he's awake, but he's been known to take naps on the regular. So if we come through the top of the mansion and tiptoe across the chairs and table, there we have it, the jiggy is ours. Afterwards, you think he'd puff up his chest some and try to get it back, but uh, nah, he comedically yippity eats up on out of there. So, at this point, you may be asking, what's the deal here? Am I trying to convince you that these two goobers are indeed some type of boss? Rubbing in the fact that you are such a fool for not even considering them as such for a mere moment. Well, not exactly, but I am trying to see where that line is drawn, for these two situations on the surface couldn't be any more different. An intense race to the finish, versus tiptoeing quietly to the prize. Wow. Although, a connecting wave length between them is the lack of physical combat needed to resolve the issue at hand. A seemingly crucial aspect of a boss that's a surefire staple in just about every single one possibly ever? Question mark? It feels near elementary to try and explain that fighting is a necessary factor for a boss, and say it with me everybody, fights. But does it really have to be limited to such a strict guideline? Are there no other ways to resolve disputes between a bear looking for his sister and a witch looking for beauty. In my head, I'd like to envision that there are so many unique ways to implement a boss type encounter without exactly needing such a combative center to them. For example, the run-ins with Shadow Mario from Sunshine are so cool to me as, while yes, you are still fighting him per se, there's more focus put on the movement and platforming aspect of chasing him that makes it all the more delightful to finally nail him down. Or how about having to play DDR to defeat God in The Simpsons game? Yep, that's an actual thing, go look it up. Admittedly, a potential fight with Napper and by extension Sandy Butt could have been rad in theory, but honestly, utilizing them more so as personified puzzles made for unique set pieces that makes their characters and surrounding areas a lot more memorable than, say, Nipper or the Black Snippets. What all of it should come down to in my precious onion is you and some kind of NPC duking it out over some sort of challenge thingy. Whether that be to the death or just a fun sled race. Who cares? Get creative, go nuts to butts. And it just so happens that one of Banjo Kazooie's greatest strengths lies within its usage of an abundance of quirky NPCs, if you couldn't tell by this point. Look to your left to see a baby eagle demanding you to fetch him a batch of worms, or look to your right to see a pirate hippo sulking over his lost treasure. But come on, it would be an awfully slippery slope to say, any of these are bosses, it would be outright stupid. In truth, deep down, I know I've stretched out this concept thin as can be. Yet, I can't help but to try to find any sort of avenue to talk about scenarios that are so refreshingly creative that teeters on that line. And maybe it's just an excuse to keep talking about this game I love, but good golly, if I don't get a chance to discuss everyone's not so favorite greedy crocodile, Mr. Vile at some point, I'm going to go a little crazy. Here we have what I presume to be one of the more infamous jiggies of the game. Probably, if go, not totally, because of the music. Vile. It is a challenge of the physical altercation of variety. Although, it's not one of fisticuffs, rather a contest to see who can devour more yumblies and grumblies. Mr. Vile's AI isn't completely dumb and can give you a much closer call than what you're probably used to if you're not not careful. He'll easily keep your same pace, so there is an encouragement to try and stick to his side, stifling any creatures that he goes in for. But take one step too slow and you'll only be hurting your own chances of victory. Which if you do lose, you can expect a chomp coming for that reptilian behind. And if you go ahead and accept his second set of games and lose again, he'll even come for your life. 
Like, no kidding, he actually does. This kind of puts Kanga's orange shenanigans to shame. You can really feel that constant pressure of enjoyable stress put onto you during this entire ordeal, as if there's a short-lived, intimate relation forming between yourself and Vile, which, if achieved organically, is one of the most important ingredients, to me, into making what you title a good boss. So, is he one? Eh, like, I'm not here to rewrite the definition of what a boss battle should be. I'd just love to have more interesting experiences to take away from the games I play, so if he is or isn't one, that doesn't really matter, just as long as he's fun to deal with. On the contrary, a lot of people would describe this particular event as something along the lines of a mini-game. Do I agree? Well, it doesn't help the narrative of this video, so I'll plead ignorance and settle with the term boss minigame. I mean, come on. To me, there's a clear difference between playing the piano with Motsan or following along to choir practice with Tip Top versus fighting for your life against a trash talking red croc. But look, it's not as if I'm here to grandstand some point in order to change your mind after all. In fact, when everything is said and done, I believe it's undeniable that Banjo Kazooie isn't the best representation of what bosses can bring to the table in a 3D platformer. However, that doesn't mean it's not an interesting study case, as I can sort of dig how well it blends whatever you may or may not consider a boss into another one of its biggest strengths. For those who've played it, you should know that Kazooie thrives in moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, meaning that there is always a new trinket of the various worlds to break off and enjoy. And, at the very least, the agreed wiki-approved bosses fit right into that mold. Old. Not even sporting traditional conventions such as health bars or locked in arenas. It's simply not a big deal when you get into one of these altercations, often not even losing control of Banjo, and if so, no more than a few seconds. What? You ran into some big bad dude who wants to kick your butt? No. Okay, cool. I don't feel like dispatching them or their entire family right now, so I'll just come back later. That, in itself, is pretty cool and quite the change of pace from the norm, I'd say say, especially jarring in comparison to Kazooie's very own sequel, where bosses are more so outright defined while in their presence, completely demanding the spotlight with their over-the-top theatrics, but I don't want to spoil that fun for another day. Well, wow, this kind of turned into what is the true meaning of a boss real fast. At first, I wasn't really even going for that angle. In all actuality, this piece about BK's bosses started off as a sort of prelude to talking about Banjo Tooie's bosses, which even that started off as a solo Minji Jongo analysis. I suppose the more I wrote in, looked into Kazooie's bosses, the more I found such an unappreciated topic that I deemed worth to talk about on the internet. How original, I know. But come on, it's not every day that someone talks so extensively about such a minute detail from a game that's been talked to death and back already. And with all due respect in the world, even if you do find such a thing, perhaps it's not the most well-documented account. Not to say my video is any better or worse, uh, that's for you schmucks to think about. I just feel like there's always new things to discuss about these relics of the past, and it's up to us individuals who actually care about them to talk about it, because if we don't, then who will? Anyways, I've been yanking your chain long enough now, I still have to answer the burning question of this video's title. What is the best boss of Banjo-Kazooie? Or I guess it really should be called, who is the best boss? Is it Konga, the Zubba's, Boss Boombox? No. I believe he suffered enough humiliation. I'm giving it to that boy, Black Snippet. Congratulations, sometimes sucking hard enough does pay off.